Hey class, this is Juan Ramirez with EE2725, Linear Circuits 3 AC. Today we're going to cover apparent power and power factor, which for the Fundamentals of Electric Circuits book is covered in chapter 11.5. Um, so far, we've looked into RMS, or effective value. So that's essentially just a different way of representing the value of um, of a signal or uh, of a voltage or a current and that's really useful for us for different power calculations that we'll, as we'll come to see we also covered instantaneous power and average power instantaneous power is kind of straightforward it's pretty much power at a given instant um, especially with ac signals the voltages and currents are time varying and so the power at any given instant is varying as well. Um, average power was a little different. Uh, we came up with sort of a generic integral form of finding average power for periodic signals. Uh, there's also sort of a shorthand form of finding the average power of sinusoidal AC signals. And that's where you would take one half of the peak voltage times the peak current times cosine of the phase angle of the voltage minus the phase angle of the current. But then I guess you might wonder why that cosine of the phase angle of the voltage minus the phase angle of the current. Um, that will become even more clear in chapter 11.6 on complex power, where we're really looking at apparent power versus real power versus reactive. What we covered last time on average power was technically average real power. Now let's take a look at apparent power. Apparent power is considered the total average power. The symbol for apparent power is not P, but rather S. The units are not watts, but rather volt amperes. Or VA. And the equation and this is four sinusoids is equal to VRMS times IRMS. It's also equal to one half V peak times I peak. Okay, so that's apparent power. It's a magnitude, kind of like aver average real power was. They're magnitudes, they're not varying with time. Um, we'll look into complex power, which actually has a real and um, imaginary component. And we're going to take a look at that in the next section. Then we're going to say, okay, well then, what, what the heck was that cosine of phi V minus phi I, right? That's actually what's called the power factor. And power factor refers to the ratio between real and apparent power. Power factor obviously varies with and that phase shift between the voltage and the current. If the voltage and the current are in phase, power factor is one, and real power is equal to reactive power. Sorry, real average power is equal to apparent power. Okay.
All right, so that's sort of the definition. Um, and the equation for power factor is equal to P over S. Right, we covered P last time, which was that um, real average power. And then S is what we're covering now, which is apparent power. Which is sort of like that total average power. Um, it's also equal to cosine of phi V, which is the phase angle of the voltage, minus phi I, which is the phase angle of the current. And power factor is really a thing that we take a close look at for sinusoids mainly. High power factors are desirable because having non-unity power factors, so a unity power factor means a power factor of one, meaning the voltage and current are in phase, uh, but so having power factors less than one um, allow for uh, or, or sometimes may mean the introduction of harmonics onto the power line. We spoke a little bit about harmonics in the RMS lecture. And so harmonics are these components that have different frequency content and they're able to get on the line and they kind of dirty the line. They add what's seen as electrical noise to the line, which is undesirable content, undesirable frequency content specifically. So you want to minimize that so that other devices that are on the line are not going to malfunction because of this non-ideality in the power coming in. Um, so high power factors are typically desirable. And then we have standards uh, for many electrical systems that have a minimum power factor requirement. So power supplies and certain higher power devices, they, they have a, the standard, you know, IEEE, IEC, um, UL, there's all these different standards. And they'll, each company will decide to comply to certain standards. Um, and the standard will require that this device doesn't draw power at a power factor less than, say, 0.95 or 0.9, as an example. Uh, and when we design circuits, we oftentimes use something called power factor correction. Um, and that, that is exactly trying to pull power that is... Um, resistive in nature. So voltage and current are in phase. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and do an example. Uh, so now we're going to look for average power, apparent power, and the power factor at the source. And of course, within a circuit, uh, you know, the power average or apparent and the power factor will be different at any point that you look, right? Because um, what you're looking at at that point is what is the voltage across those two points and how much current is flowing through that point. And so sometimes we're going to see voltages and currents represented in RMS. 
if there isn't an RMS right after that voltage unit, that means it's the value, the ampli the, the sort of magnitude is referring to the amplitude of the voltage signal. It's a peak value. Um, but if it does have RMS, then it's an RMS value instead of a peak value. And you could assume that it's sinusoidal. We're going to only work with sinusoidal signals unless it's very specifically indicated that it's a different type of signal. All right, so we have the circuit. Um, and now we want to look for apparent power, average power, and the power factor uh, at the source. So we're going to look at the current coming out of the source and the voltage at the source. Well, how do you find the current coming out of the source? Well, you, you probably guessed it current coming out of the source will be equal to the voltage at the source over the impedance, the equivalent impedance. And if you have RMS voltage, the impedance is going to be the same. The equivalent impedance isn't RMS. You don't convert it into RMS. Um, but what will happen is that the current you end up with is going to be in RMS. And the impedance is simply, you know, the resistor and the capacitor are in series, so impedance will be 10 minus J15. All right, and we're getting a little bit better at using our calculators, hopefully. Uh, and so minimal operations of a calculator should get you to 0.55 amps RMS with a phase angle of 56.3 degrees. Okay, so now we have a current. Now let's take a look at average power. So again, average power is, is going to be real power. So here we will say average power is equal to, there's two ways of calculating it and they will give you exactly the same answer. There's a way when you, where you use a peak value, one half times the peak voltage times the peak current, times cosine of the, you know, or times the power factor. Um, the other is using RMS values. Since we know that for a sinusoid, the RMS value is the peak value divided by square root of 2. Times the power factor. Which is equal to cosine uh, 5V minus 5I. Okay. Um, so what is the RMS value of the voltage? That's 10 volts. RMS value of the current, 0.55 amps. And then the power factor is cosine phase angle of the voltage minus phase angle of the current. Again, or I guess I should mention, uh, Specify that the power factor is unitless, so it doesn't have units. Um, and what we end up with is 3.05 watts. That's your average power. Okay, let's take a look at a parent power. A parent power is just the VRMS 
times the I RMS. That's pretty straightforward. It's 10 volts, 0.55 amps. That gives you 5.5 volt amps. And then the power factor. We essentially had to calculate it to get to the average power. Power factor is cosine of the phase angle of the voltage minus the phase angle of the current. And that gives you 0.56. And you also notice that the power factor is equal to the real power over the apparent power. The real power is that average real power, which was 3.05 over 5.5. That gives you about uh, 0.56. So that's a different way of calculating it. Um, all right. I guess one other sort of brief example I'll do is we'll take a look at the connection to an electric motor. Let's say you are going to connect an electric motor to the power line, right? And maybe this electric motor is to power like a, a really big fan because, um, you know, maybe at home your heater is not working. Or, sorry, not heater, your AC is not working. It's middle of summer and uh, it's really hot. So you want to connect a, a pretty big induction motor to a fan, a really big fan that, that really blows a good amount of air and, and, and cools you guys off. So uh, as an engineer, you'll say, hey, I took EE2725. I know how to do this, sort of. I'm not a motors expert, but know a little bit about power. Okay, so I'm going to say connection. of one horsepower induction motor okay um so what do we have we have a source of 120 volts maybe maybe you got adventurous maybe you got adventurous and you said hey uh you know you might have told your dad, I don't know, mom, hey, let's work together and maybe connect the breaker to the 240 volt line because this motor is going to pull some power. I don't want to trip the existing breakers. So let's say we're using a 240 volt source. 240 is RMS. Okay. Um, so again, the power system of your residential home, at least in the U.S., uh, 120 is voltage, 120 is the voltage from line to neutral, 240 is from line to line. Um, okay, and then you actually have the connection that's a really ugly inductor. A little better. So then you have the connection of your motor. Um, your motor looks like a resistor and an inductor. It does. So that's just, I don't know, FYI. Um, so that resistance might look like, I don't know, um, it might be like 1 over 250, so.
Okay, maybe like five milliohms. And then there's a good amount of inductance. We could say maybe one zero one. So ten milliohms of um, reactance, right? If we're looking at the inductance as an impedance, um, then you have though. I am so bad at drawing resistors today. Then we have an induct or sort of. Oh my goodness. Then we have a resistive and inductive power line, right? I'm going to say RL, I'm going to say XL, X for reactance. We have the power line, which has these parasitic values. Those parasitic values will change the voltage and current, right? There's going to be a voltage drop across them. So let's assume that the RL and XL change our voltage such that you have a different voltage here. I'm going to call it V capital M for V motor. And then you have the same current because your induction motor is in series with the parasitic impedance of the cabling that goes from the power system. You know, you wired up that circuit breaker on your main distribution panel to, to be able to connect to 240 put that circuit breaker on there, and then you have a bunch of line that goes from there all the way to the other side of the house, which is where you have the fan. So non, not negligible resistive and uh, reactive components to that impedance. Okay, so say I made up a VM of... 220... Um, and let's say 15 degrees, um, negative 15 degrees. All right, and then let's say the current drawn uh, was about Here at one horsepower, so maybe about three amps. Okay. Um, and that three amps could be well we could let's let's make up a value. Um I know that for an inductive load, the current lags the voltage, which I mean the current has to be less than the phasing load, the current has to be less than the voltage. So let's say it's negative 45 degrees. All right. So then we may say, okay, what is the power factor at the source? And what's the power factor at the load? Okay, so at the source, I have the phase angle of the voltage, which is zero, and the phase angle of the current, right? The current from the source is the same as the current going to that motor, assuming you don't have any other line um, loads in parallel to this motor. Okay, so uh, cosine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2, which is 0 0.707. And this is what we're going to call a lagging power factor. Why is it a lagging power factor? It's lagging because the current lags the voltage. All 
All right. And so that's why a lot of times at the sort of the chapter nine the, on sinusoids, where we were looking at leading and lagging between voltage and current, we would oftentimes look at current first and then voltage. That's sort of the convention people have followed. Okay, how about at the load? Well, at the load, the voltage is different. Vm is the voltage at the load. The current's the same, voltage is different. Um, that voltage, we said, in the phase angle is negative 15 degrees. And then minus the phase angle of the current, which is negative 45 degrees. Um, and that's going to be square root of 3 over 2. And of course, I don't remember that one off the top of my head. 0.866. Maybe I did. But that's still a lagging power factor. Because still, the current has a phase angle smaller than the phase angle of the voltage. And that's true for all inductive loads. For a capacitive load, the current leads the voltage. And for a resistive load, if it's purely resistive, that means the impedance is a resistor, no reactive components, um, then the power factor is going to be zero, and it's a, you know the voltage and current are in phase. Okay, so that's sort of the, a little bit more of the practical aspect, and I wanted to kind of insert that. Um, otherwise, that's what apparent power and power factor are. And next, we'll take a look at a more holistic view where we look at complex power and try to make sense of the power triangle we use for analysis, and then apply this to a few more examples. Thank you very much for joining.